Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace. I'm Johnette Benkovic. We're live today for another Women of Grace simulcast. It's always a joy to be with you on these occasions via EWTN television and radio, the internet, and all manner of social media. Our phone screeners are standing by and eager to take your calls. You know it brings us joy to receive your comments, your insights, inspirations, and words of encouragement here on Women of Grace. I'll be giving you the phone number throughout the course of the program, and we'll do our best to get you on the air when you call in. If you are out there on social media, note that we are there with you too via EWTN Radio's Facebook page and YouTube channel. You can submit your questions or comments that way as well. If there is a perfect pattern for our lives, surely it must be outlined for us in the eight Beatitudes. In them, we see the heart of Jesus and the face of the Father. But in them, too, we find a perfect pattern for parenting, especially as it applies to dads. The unfortunate reality is that many men forfeit their fatherly vocations to careers, hobbies, and even sports. They invest themselves in the fleeting, rather than the everlasting, and it is their children who suffer. A father will always be remembered by his impact on his family, whether it be positive or negative, and that impact will be felt in the current generation and future generations as well. The Beatitudes, or as our guest today put it, the Bedatitudes, can become a launch pad for new fathers and also a path back for dads who may have stumbled in the past. I am eager to welcome Dr. Gregory Popchak and Lisa Popchak to our program today to offer us their insight and wisdom on parenting in light of the Bedatitudes, or the Beatitudes of Christ. But prior to having them on the set with us today, I have a very special guest with me and a very special announcement to make. So stay tuned. You won't want to miss what is coming up. We are women of grace around the throne of the Lord Most High. Oh, and we lift up our praise from the depths of our souls here at home. precious word here at EWTN. It describes the relationship we feel toward our colleagues, viewers, and our listeners. Likewise, within the apostolate of Women of Grace, that familial sentiment runs deep and strong. So it is with great joy that I have the pleasure of sharing with you my family good news. One of my favorite scripture passages, as you well know, is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. God speaks through his prophet and says, I know well the plans I have in mind for you, plans for your welfare, not your woe, plans for a future full of hope. God is always about something amazing in our lives. It comes as a sign of his love for us and his providential care for us as his children. And it is my joy to tell you I am experiencing this reality in a new way. May I introduce to you my fiance, Mr. Jack Williams, general manager of EWTN Radio and host of Open Line, heard Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on EWTN Radio and its radio partners. Let's welcome Jack Williams. Jack, welcome to the set of Women of Grace. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a very exciting time for us. Yes, it and is. And hopefully it'll be a very exciting time for our family, those of yes. us who uh, are really the impetus for what we do uh, right. here at EWTN and at Women of Grace. That's exactly right. So I'm sure it's surprising for many people to hear about our upcoming nuptials, which I am very excited about. Well, it's, it's surprising to us as well. Uh, you know, we've talked about this at great length, but this is really not anything that either one of us expected uh, or certainly we're looking for. Uh, as most of you are aware, uh, we are both widowed. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony has been gone, it'll be 11 years in April. That's right. Interestingly enough, it'll be two years in April uh, that Susie passed away. That's right. And I think that both of us had acquired some sort of a comfort level with our widowhood. And both of us had the great grace of witnessing a happy death. That's right. In the eyes of Holy Mother Church with the passing of each of our spouses. 
which certainly made things easier. And I didn't think that, uh, quite frankly, that the capacity to love again the way that I love Susie was really ever going to be in the cards for me. Yeah. You know, it was surprising for me too, Jack, to consider that because Anthony and I had a long-term marriage, you know, almost 34 years. We loved each other very, very much. Um, but, you know, I kind of liken it to having children, you know. Uh, when you have that first baby, you're not sure that you can love another child as much as you love that first. And then what happens is God gifts you with another child. And you realize that love dilates the heart. It makes room in the heart for more. And it doesn't mean that you don't love that first child anymore. Uh, but it does mean that God gives you a new opportunity to experience something unique and special. And that's how I look at our relationship. You know, God dilated our hearts and he's gifted us with each other. And there's something very unique and special about Johnette and Jack and Jack and Johnette that uh, marks this relationship in time. I don't think there's any question about that. It's a, it's a beautiful thing that our Lord has done in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not as though, um, we know better than he does what we need at any given time. That's right. And we've talked about this at length when after Susie had passed, um, you know, when I was at work going about the business of what I do, everything was fine for the most part. Um, and when I got home, I wasn't miserable by any stretch of the imagination, but I just, I didn't quite know what I was supposed to be doing when I wasn't at work. And so um, when our Lord brought you into my life, it made me realize just how lonely I actually was. Mm -hmm. And I know you've experienced a similar emotion. And really I liken it to kind of being, especially in those moments when I wasn't at work, you know, I kind of liken it to being adrift without a rudder, no land in sight, as we read about with Noah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that can be a bit of an overwhelming feeling sometimes when you don't know what you're going or don't know where you're going, but through the grace of God and through his infinite mercy and love for myself as well as you, he sent me a dove. Jack, thank you. In that moment with a little hyssop sprig in her beak <laughs> and uh, provided for me the rudder mm -hmm. and, uh, and guided us to what I hope will be many, many years of dry land. Yes. Yeah, that's such a beautiful analogy. And the first time that you shared that with me, it touched my heart so very deeply. And every time you tell it, it touches my heart so very deeply. And, you know, I think that um, it's important for us to realize that, you know, marriage is a vocation. It is. Um, it is a path that God selects for us to be purified in this life that we might achieve eternal life. And so while every marriage has its ups and its downs and its joys and its sorrows, when it is rooted in our Lord Jesus Christ and in a life of prayer, then you have a firm foundation upon which to build. And, you know, I think it's important to share with all of you that we've really constituted that from the very beginning of our relationship, from the very beginning of the moment that you, Jack, asked if you could court me. We didn't date, we courted. So why don't you explain the difference between the two? We did, and we had, it's, a, it's something that's, that's somewhat lost, I think, in our culture today. But, um, you know, we weren't dating, we weren't out looking around, but, you know, this was something that we both felt the Lord had put on our hearts and that he had brought us together for that purpose. And um, we decided early on that if the Lord was bringing us together, that people in our situation, men and women, would be brought together for one purpose, and that would be to discern whether or not this would be a sacramental situation for us. And we agreed early on that if that were not the case, if either of us determined that we didn't think this was leading to the altar, then it needed to be over at, at that point, at least on this level. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, everything that we've done, the beauty of this is, you know, Johnette brings me closer to our Lord. Oh, and my thoughts of Johnette shift to thoughts of our Lord with uh, such abundant ease. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just one of the most beautiful things that I've ever experienced. And, you know, everything we've done from the outset that has been so beautiful is that it's been rooted in our Lord and our Lady. That's exactly right. Um, it, the beauty of it, when we made our intentions known to one another, we had the great opportunity to begin a novena 
to Our Lady of Sorrows, mm -hmm. which ended on the vigil of her feast. Yes. And the first thing we did after we had stated our intentions to each other when we were together for the first time after that is immediately paid a visit to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament yes. at Our Lady of Sorrows Parish. Yes, yes, and if we had more time, <laughs> I would go through all of the amazing, amazing signs that we've had from our Lord that have indicated this, um, even involving our Mother Angelica right. in some ways. We've visited Hansville and visited the uh, resting place of Mother and uh, asked for her intercession. And, uh, you know, I, I think, Jack, you know, the, the fact of the matter is there's hope. And that's why that passage of, of Jeremiah 29, verse 11 is so important to me, especially in light of this, um, because, you know, God does have plans for us, friends. He, he does have something in mind for us. And we never know when it's going to come or how it's going to come. You know, I was a widow for 10 years, and here we are almost into the uh, celebration of the 11th year of that and and never anticipated that there would be uh, this opportunity and yet God surprises us so I don't know what you're struggling with today or where you are in terms of your own particular state in life or uh, what sorrow is very close to your heart right now but I can tell you one thing and this I know truly and really and absolutely God will work good out of it it might not happen in your timing, but it will most definitely happen in the perfect time, the time that he knows is best for you. And then we can receive that gift with openness and receptivity of heart and allow the, the, the grace of God to infill us and to move us on to a new place, a new place in our relationship with him, a new place in, in, in our spiritual life, a new place in our emotional life, a new place in our natural lives. God has good things in mind for us, right? He does, and I would hold close, John Ann and I have, if you're in, in a situation perhaps similar, we've held close to the Holy Family as our model. Mm -hmm. uh, our Lady has been most abundant in her intercession for us. It's mm -hmm. been very apparent to us. And St. Joseph has been a wonderful model for us because aside from Our Lady, he is probably the most beautiful example we have of authentic humility and strength mm -hmm. that we've ever seen for anybody. Yes. And we are so abundantly grateful and the ladies are watching, Johnette. I know the ladies are watching and they wanna see, they wanna see the evidence. It is there, ladies, it is definitely there. <laughs> and I am quite pleased, quite pleased. And we are abundantly pleased to share that with each one of you that have meant so much to us. You are why we do what we do. That's right, that's right. So we are going to go to a break and Jack is going to leave our set and I'm going to welcome the Pop Checks, our guest today, and we're gonna continue with our program. We invite you to stay tuned right here to Women of Grace Live today. We'll be right back. The Liturgy of the Hours. What does this ancient but ever new canticle of divine praise offer for the prayer life of the lay Catholic? Now, from Retreat Master Father Timothy Gallagher, an illuminating guide to a new prayer experience. In the midst of all the activity of the day, can we pray constantly throughout the day? Can the day be really punctuated with moments of prayer from start to finish? Discover how to sanctify each minute of the day with the Liturgy of the Hours for Lay People, a five-part mini-retreat on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. Hi, I'm Doug Keck. Join me next time when I'll be speaking with Father Joseph Mary Wolf about Mother Angelica's book, Mother Angelica, God, His Home, and His Angels. The, the dignity of one human soul surpasses the rest of the material universe, and that's what Mother is bringing about here. Why? Because we are made in the image and likeness of God. That's Mother Angelica on God, His Home, and His Angels with Father Joseph next time on Bookmark. To pray and to work, a long-standing motto of St. Benedict. Within the heart of South Africa, a simple young man would build schools for the poor and impoverished with his own hands. By his humble and compassionate example, he would encourage many young students to embrace the Catholic faith. Teacher, catechist, martyr, he was 
Chimangazzo, the story of Benedict Dazwa, here on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. Through the Blessed Virgin Mary, the light of the world dwelt among us. EWTN takes you to the Basilica of the Annunciation in Nazareth as the faithful venerate the Mother of God with prayers and thanksgiving. Join the Marian procession from the Holy Land Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern here on EWTN. Welcome back, everyone. As you heard in the open to our program today, the Beatitudes form for us a model to live by. And additionally, they serve as a perfect pattern after which to model our parenting. For dads, the Beatitudes give the gold standard on servant leadership, his holy duty within the structure of the family. What are the Beatitudes and what do they inform us? And how can we embrace them and live by them, especially fathers? Today, our guests will explore this question and its answers. Let's welcome Dr. Gregory Popchak and Lisa Popchak, authors of many books, including the one we will be discussing today, The Beatitudes, Eight Ways to Be an Awesome Dad, available for you at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Go to EWTNRC.com to order. And now let's welcome Dr. Gregory Popchak and Lisa Popchak. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's uh, great to have you with us. It's so great to be here on such a special, wonderful day. <laughs> it was a special and wonderful <laughs> moment for me. Let me follow that up. Go ahead. <laughs> so well, I, I, I was so abundantly happy to be able to share that news with, um, with all of you, our viewers and our listeners today. But, you know, so happy, too, to have you as our guests because you, you have done so much to help individuals in their marriages, so much in their family life, so much in meeting the daily demands and challenges that are part of the reality of life today that can tear apart the delicate fabric of a marriage, of a family structure. And your books give us great hope. Uh, and they give us great guidance, and they give us, you know, practical applications of how to do things. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I so love this book, you know, because it's eight beatitudes based on the beatitudes that oh, really. See what I did there? Yeah, it, it was very <laughs> clever. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not clever with titles like that. I have to admit, but you are. And and uh, you know, it, it illustrates something for us and brings something to mind. And that is that you know, God has a plan for us, and He gives us the plan. We just have to follow it out. You know. It doesn't mean it's not going to be uh, difficult from time to time. But the fact of the matter is, it does say that we're not on our own, that we do have a rudder, and that rudder is our Lord Jesus Christ. So go ahead, Lisa. Well, it's absolutely true. And I think that leading in with your wonderful announcement, I think really sets this up so well. Because we often, I think, as Catholics, look at sacramental life and family life as almost two different things. Yes. You know, the sacrament happened the day of the wedding. And then there's all this stuff we have to do. Right. And the sacrament happens when we baptize the child or bring it for First Holy Communion. But then there's the hardness of life. Right. And that's just not the truth. And you and Jack are showing that so well to all of your wonderful viewers who are seeing, yeah, no, they're looking at this sacramentally every day, every day of their courtship, every day for the rest of their lives. And we can do that too. And it's not just about what goes on at church. It's very much about what goes on in the day to day. Well, yeah, you know, and I, I was, uh, you know, just you mentioned, mentioned ministry in, in what you just said, you know, yeah. and, and uh, I think a lot of people think that ministry is that churchy stuff you do at church, right? Yes. Um, but ministry is really any activity that we engage in that communicates the love of God to another person. And in that sense, marriage and family life is the most important ministry we can do as lay people because we're, we're able to convey God's love first to each other and then to our children and then to the world as well. And God is loving all of us through that. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons I was so excited when Greg did Bedatitudes mm -hmm. is because as you were saying in the lead-in, so many men don't know how to do this. That's they right. don't know what it means to do the day-to-day -day of the sacramental living. Well, you know, I, I think that that's a very important point because unfortunately today we don't have role models. You know, we don't like to talk about the bad news and we really want to concentrate on the good news. But the fact of the matter is we have to couch all of the good news in the day and time in which we live. Otherwise, we lose the importance and the significance of it for that moment. And when we look at the landscape of family life today, there are so many homes that are broken homes where the dad is absent, mom is raising the children on their own. And so a young 
young little guys coming up, right? And, and who is he modeling himself? Who, who wears the pattern, right? And as a result of that, they don't know how to do it. So they enter into a marriage and they want to be the best that they can be. You know, they, they want to be a good husband. They want to be a good father, but they just don't know how to do it. And that's why this is so important and so good. Well, yeah, you know, and that's actually the inspiration for the book. You know, a lot of the work that we do is working with couples and with families who really want the best for their spouse, for their children, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe didn't come from the best background or didn't don't, don't have a personal model to turn to. And we, you know, we're reflecting a lot on, you know, so how do you respond to that? And, right. you know, I, I, Pope Francis gave an interview where he said that the Beatitudes are our blueprint for Christian living. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's sort of light bulb moment sort of hit and I started thinking, well, you know, what would the Beatitudes then say about marriage and especially parenting and fatherhood in particular? And I just started praying through each of the Beatitudes in, in relationship to my fatherhood and, and seeing what wisdom I could get from that to kind of communicate this model of uh, how men could be fathers after God the Father's own heart. Right. And, I, and it really occurred to me that each of the Beatitudes has an insight for Christian fathers that allows us to look to God the Father as our model. Right. Wherever we come from, we can be great fathers as long as we parent with God the Father. Well, and that is it, isn't it? I mean, every father is meant to share in the reality of who God the Father is, the Father in the household. And, and this is kind of revolutionary thinking, uh, especially on the ears of contemporary culture. But, but every man who is called to be father is meant to be the presence of God the Father in the home. Right. And, and so who is God the Father? He's the provider. He's the protector. He's the one who leads us and guides us. And those are the fundamental masculine charisms that need to be brought out in a, in a very special way and real way in the life of a uh, family, uh, in, in raising the children, for example. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, the Beatitudes really reveal how God the Father parents us. That's right. And so we, we pattern then our relationship with our spouse and children after the way he loves us and he reveals that love to us through the Beatitudes. You know, and I want to comment on this too because this is something that, that I've always um, uh, found, um, which word that I want to use, uh, I've always found this to be admirable uh, in, in the way in which you have conducted yourselves throughout your married life uh, and in the w raising of children. I mean, your faith is, is absolutely the most important thing in the world to you. Yeah. And it's what undergirds and gives breath to everything else that you do. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I just got to say this, friends, you know, we, we have to take note of that. Uh, we've got to make certain that we are really rooted where we need to be. Do we do it perfectly? No. Do we sin? Yes. Do we seek repentance? Hopefully. Right? And we move on, right? We take the grace that God gives us and we move forward with it. But the fact of the matter is, if Jesus is in our crosshairs all of the time, we're going to do things differently. And I remember a book that you, you all wrote years ago, years ago, and it had to do with parenting your children. And, and one of the things that to this day stands out so much was just one line from the whole book. It was a takeaway. It was, you know, what virtues do you want your children to, uh, to thrive in? What were those virtues? Raise your children for those virtues. Mm -hmm. And that was, to me, it was like, golly, that's so simple, but not so easy to do. Right. And no. we're talking about virtuous parenting and virtuous marriages here. And it's, it's not simple to do when you've got the noise of the world in your ears. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have the other mothers in the pickup line at school saying, oh, my kid's going to, you know, get into Harvard or my kid's going to make it to the NFL or fill in the blank. And it's all these very um, temporary goals, yes. but your child can make it wherever God wants them to be to live out their vocation here if you're raising them with a real sense of what those most important virtues they were created to, to live out, those mm -hmm. charisms they were created to live mm -hmm. out as that unique and unrepeatable person in the image and likeness of God. And once you instill that in them, the rest of it, it just makes sense, it clicks, it gives them a real internal guideposts so that you don't have to hawk it over them all the time. <laughs> well, makes parenting a little bit easier. <laughs> and we actually explore that idea in, in, the, in the chapter on blessed uh, are the dads who uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Right. right? Uh, because r pursuing righteousness in family life is, is, is not just about making sure that everybody's doing the right thing. It's about cultivating a heart that, mm -hmm. that longs for that virtue, right? And so we talk about practical ways that, that we can kind of keep those virtues out in front. You know, for example, you know, uh, in the course of a week saying, 
you know, we could all really work on speaking a little more respectfully to each other this week. So, so sit, you sit down with the kids as the dad and say, uh, you know, what do we need to do to, to handle this situation a little more respectfully? Or how would, could we handle that a little more respectfully? And you actually kind of write it down and then talk about it every day over dinner. You know, how do right. we do with that today? You know, and you're just keeping those virtues out in the front. It's very casual. It's not, how oh, have we been respectful to each other today? <laughs> you know, it's just very, you know, it's just part of the, the, the conversation of family life that we bring those virtues in and, and reflect on them lightly and casually. But in terms of our everyday life, so we're really living our faith and practicing that, that righteousness in our home. You know, that's a very Ignatian thing to do, don't sure. you? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> it's like a particular examination of yeah. conscience right there at the dinner table, right. you know? Yeah. And, and, and that's a beautiful thing. And, it, you know, as you're talking about that, of course, if you're raising your children in virtue, then it's very natural that we need to be looking at ourselves to see if we are living that virtue out, you know? So you talk about this, this beatitude mm -hmm. of, of righteousness. Dads are righteous and just, right? Mm -hmm. So am I righteous? Am I just? And it, it's like a daily check for us. You can't give what you don't have. Right? That's right. So it's important to really reflect on those qualities first and say, you know, am I modeling this stuff? You yeah. know, I want my kids to be responsible. Am I following through on my promises to them? I want them to be respectful. Am I speaking to them respectfully? Or, am I, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, you, you start learning that God gives you the children that you need and that he communicates, and he communicates, and he communicates to you through them just as much as you are forming them. Yeah. And that's an important thing to remember, you know? because uh, God wants us perfected. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. he does give us what we need for that perfection. But you've written a book too uh, on the corporal works of mommy. Yeah. And see, this is what I think is so delightful and so charming is because you're taking things uh, from sacred scripture, but you're giving them a very real practical application to state in life. And that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, well, that wasn't my idea. That was my son's idea um, when he was seven and he was getting ready for his first Holy Communion, I was making breakfast one morning and just going over the corporal works of mercy. Right. And as he heard, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, he went, you know, Mom, this should really be called the corporal works of mommy because you do this stuff all day long, <laughs> which was cute. Yeah, and very, but what very it did was it, it hit me. Exactly, Joanna. Yeah. It, was, it was that moment where God said, hey, maybe you could really see the value in this. Yeah. You know, maybe you can stop listening to the world telling you it's all drudgery and that it's something to want to shirk off and really look at it. And I loved being a mom, but I really got a sense that, wow, you know, this is a spiritual exercise. This will impart God to my children and also bring God to me. And it, mm -hmm. it really became something amazing. In our it's homes. not just another pile of laundry. It's no, not just another meal right. to cook. It's not just something else to dust. It's really that ministry yeah. of bringing God's love to my family. And, yeah. and you know, we think of, of those corporal and spiritual works of mercy as things that we have to do in those, uh, in, in, you know, in doing missionary work in, in third world countries. But in reality, you know, God gives us a million opportunities to do it every single day in a context of our home, communicating God's love through those little works, that little way of family life. Yeah, well, and, it, and what you're talking about here is revisioning your life. It's a total, to, to use a psychological word, I'm gonna yeah. pull out my two cents <laughs> of psychology here. <laughs> it's a reframing. Yeah. It's seeing yes. things through a totally different lens, right? And by seeing it through a different lens, there's a transformation and a change that takes place in us. So these are very beautiful, beautiful realities in our lives. I wanna get back to this idea. So I'm gonna ask you this, Greg. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just thinking here that if you've written this book on the Beatitudes, it's because this is how you've patterned your fathering. Well, it, it, it is, and, uh, and it's, it's how I, I kind of challenge myself every day to do a little bit better, right? Because mm -hmm. like you said, we're, none of us are perfect, mm -hmm. and, we're, and God is always working to perfect us. And so, you know, in, in constantly kind of praying through how does God want me to be a father after the father's own heart. I'm always looking for, for you know, different resources or things to reflect on it. And the Beatitudes have really been uh, an important part of that reflection. And so, you know, I was really happy to be able to get the opportunity to do the book um, because I, I think that, as I said earlier, you know, so many men are looking for a role model. They're looking for some place to turn for guidance. And, and the Beatitudes really do reveal the God the Father's heart and help us pattern ourselves after him. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. And here we go, friends. We're gonna go to our break. And as we go, I wanna hold the book up 
up for you again to see. It's the Be Daditudes, and it's eight ways to be an awesome dad, mm -hmm. written by our guest today, Gregory Popchak. And as I tell you, when you go out to EWTNRC.com, if you just put their name in the search engine, P-O-P-C-A-K, P-O-P-C-A-K, bunches of books, including the Corporal Works of Mommy, will pop up for you there. They're all available for you right out there at EWTNRC.com. We're going to be right back after our break, inviting you to stay with us and give us a call, too. Why not? The numbers are there for you. Stay with us. Across the cosmic chessboard of history, a what-if clash of life and death philosophies. What is the value of human life? I'm Dr. Benjamin Weicker. That's Margaret Sanger, the foundress of Planned Parenthood, champion of birth control, along with Pope Paul VI, champion of the church's moral rejection of contraception. You do not have children. You are not a mother. You do not understand anything. The church is mother to millions. Yes, Mrs. Sanger, I understand. It's a timeless discourse, a showdown between the prophets of darkness and light. Turn back the clock and witness Saints vs. Scoundrels, a two-part EWTN original production on the Eternal Word Television Network. Next time on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, Congressman Keith Rothfuss breaks down why it's important to pass pro-life policies. And we share some of our favorite stories in a special edition show. That's next time on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Amidst an impoverished land, one priest would establish many schools for the poor. Facing down an elite clergy and a growing secular movement, he would risk everything, even his own life. Poveda, here on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. Friends, we are visiting with our guests today. We've got Dr. Gregory and Lisa Popchek with us. So excited to be talking about this book, The Be Daditudes, Eight Ways to Be an Awesome Dad. This is your opportunity to call in with your questions and your comments, your insights, your inspirations, your words of encouragement, 800 221-9460 is the 800 number for those of you who are here in the United States of America or Canada, 800-221-9460. Six zero. You can also reach us via 1-205-271-2980 if you're outside of North America. That's 1-205-271-2980. Just thinking you've got some questions, we're here to answer them for you today. You know, this, this whole notion of patterning our lives um, after this blueprint that Jesus gives us is so unique. So let's talk just a little bit about this business of being poor in spirit and how that applies to fathering. You know, um, poverty of spirit, it really has to do with being willing to embrace and acknowledge the fact that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I have no idea how to be a godly father. What is that about, right? Um, and, and there's a certain freedom that comes from that. You know, I think yeah. that a lot of men uh, pretend that we have to have it all together. We have to have, in fact, I get uh, comments from this at uh, men's conferences all the time. You know, I know I'm supposed to be the head of my household, you know, head of my family, the spiritual head of my family. How do I do that, you know? And uh, that has to feel like an awesome responsibility. Yeah, it kind of you know? is. I mean, you, 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 you get the impression you're supposed to have all the answers at the 
already, and, you, and of course you don't, right? And and uh, so you, so a lot of guys try to pretend, you know. And so then we act all authoritarian, and you know, I have spoken, you know. And, it, and of course that's you know, it's <laughs> coming. That doesn't go very far. You know, I mean, it, yeah. comes, it comes from a, a good place, you know, at least a well-intentioned place, but it, it it ends up falling flat in a lot of ways. So the bl blessed are the dads who are poor in spirit. It's really all about being willing to acknowledge, I have no idea what I'm doing, and that's okay, you know? Yes. Um, I, I bring that to God and I say, you know, Lord, you know what yes. you want me to do, and, and I'm asking you to teach me, moment by moment, day by day, week by week, I'm gonna trust in you. Mm -hmm. and, and I like to think of um, fathers as, not so much the head of the household as much as the first disciple in the household. It's my job to be that, that first disciple uh, and, and, and to bring my heart to God first and then lead my, my wife and my children to do the same uh, by, by my example. And so, you know, coming to God in prayer and saying, you know, okay, God, I don't know how to handle this. What do you want me to do? And then going back to my wife or, you know, saying that, you know, okay, my kids have done this. I don't know how to handle that, and now what do you want me to do? And then going back to my kids. And so really rooting my fatherhood in that prayerful relationship with, with my Heavenly Father. I have to say the fruit that I've seen that bear, I choke up when I think about it in my kids' lives because when Greg comes to any of us, but especially the kids, and says, pray with me about this, because I don't know what you need, but God does. Yeah. Then I've seen our kids grow up and be not afraid yes. to come to their dad and say, I'm at a loss. What do I do? Help me figure this out. Mm -hmm. And he can give them his advice. Goodness knows, you know, as a psychologist, he's got so much advice to give. But he'll never just do that without praying with them first and mm -hmm. saying, you know, you're God's kid first. Let's right. figure this out together. So our kids as we were talking about earlier, will strive very hard to reach for those virtues that they've identified for themselves, that we've helped them try to achieve, but they know that it's always okay to not have it all together, That's that right. they can ask God, and that they have parents who will pray with them and guide them as best we can, and I've really seen that bear tremendous fruit. Well, and one thing I want to highlight that you just said, you know, I don't want to give the impression that it's a dad's job to just kind of go off by ourselves in the wilderness and, and have this, you know, <laughs> theophany where God reveals to us what the big plan for our family life is, and then we go back and say, now, wife, this is what God has told me for you. It, it really is much more about, you know, Lisa comes to me and says, you know, well, this is happening. What do, what, what do you think we should do? And Beats me, let's pray about it. <laughs> you know? Or I think this and you think that, so let's pray about it. Or the kids have this desire or are showing this misconduct, yeah. but there's some positive intention behind it. Let's bring let's it to God it. and work yeah. it out together. And as you said, it's not the wilderness or going off to the men's retreat or the men's group and hearing from other dads, hey, this is what you need to do in your house. Right. It's working it out with the family that God's given him. Yeah. And it's, it's worked very well, and I think that it keeps you from feeling overly stressed. Obviously. Yeah, well, because well, God's in charge. It, we, the beautiful thing here, and, and what you're demonstrating, just in what you're saying, the beautiful thing here is, is, is the complementarity between husband and wife. And this is why the going is so hard for single parents, you know. It's tough to be a dad when mommy's not there. It's tough to be mommy when dad isn't there. Sure. Each, each, each uh, parent brings something unique by virtue of their masculinity and or femininity to that, that uh, rearing of the children and uh, providing a balance and a, co a counterbalance to each other, right? And, and so it, it's very hard. And, you know, I'm just thinking, friends, you know, maybe some of you are struggling in that right, right this very minute. We want to encourage you to call because you've got experts sitting on the set today. You know, you don't always have that opportunity. 800-221-9460, 800-221-9460. Six zero is the way that you can call if you're in North America. Outside of North America, it's country code 1-205-271-2980. That's 1-205-271-2980. And the beautiful thing here, too, that's so very important, is that you're talking about this um, uh, relationship that you have, this communicative ability to work the problems out together. Dad, I think, is the one who permits that to happen more than mom. 
Well, yeah, and, and, and you know, so when I talk about uh, blessed are the dads who are peacemakers, you know, in, yeah. in the Beatitudes, um, you know, peace, being a peacemaker isn't just about, you know, keeping, the, how, keeping order in the house, you know, making sure nobody sets the dog on fire today. <laughs> It, it, Which it, is helpful. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, <laughs> you should start there at least. I'm like <laughs> but, but you know, it, it's it's ultimately about you know, making sure that the, that there's a, a kind of an orderly spirit in the house that things happen in a right order. You know, mm -hmm. um, th that that well, for example, when there's a problem, then making sure that you know let let's not fight it out among ourselves. Let let's go to God first. Mm -hmm. Let's let's take that moment to really reflect on what God's will might be for us, and and let's take that moment to really talk out what we're trying. To to do mm -hmm. and maybe how we could do it better there and I think dad can really facilitate that role you know I, I when 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 fathers ask me kind of about you know well, well what does his headship really look like you know in yeah, that's life, that's an uncomfortable it's a tough term yeah, for a yeah, lot of people. yeah yeah it really is hard and and it's not this sort of autocratic you know I am spoken because I'm the dad kind of a thing the way I like to it's a metaphor that kind of resonates with a lot of men like if, if you're the if you're the chairman of the board you know if you're running a corporate board or a you know whatever a board meeting you, you don't just get to go in there and say this is my agenda and this is what we're going to do now get out there you know you you facilitate the process, That's right. right? But everybody has to have their say, and it's your job as the chair to really take the best of what everybody has and try to put it together in a way that will make everyone happy, that really reflects the best gifts that everybody brings to that table. And so you're facilitating that process and you're facilitating that order, but you're not running the show. You're not a dictator. No, exactly. You're not a taskmaster, no. right? Yeah. But you, I think you, as the husband, um, need to develop the most listening ear to God in your household, to the members of your household, also to God, as, as you and Jack were talking about, mm -hmm. you know, using St. Joseph as your model. Who heard God better mm -hmm. than St. Joseph, even in his dreams? That's right. Right? Because he was so attuned to listening, because God wanted to speak the purposes for his family into the world. And when a father does that, and he's going to develop that listening ear and hear God in prayer and in what his family is saying, then he's he can't fail because God's got his back. Yeah, you know, and, and it's interesting, something just occurred to me for the very first time as you were talking about, the, you know, St. Joseph and his listening ear. God did not go to Mary and say to Mary, wake your husband up, you're going to Egypt. <laughs> you know? He didn't do that. He went to the husband. There's something about that, even, even in that depiction there in sacred scripture, that, that kind of indicates to us something about this order that God's establishing for a reason. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is this, this input, I love that, this, this idea of, you know, you facilitate the discussion, but it's for you to make the decision. And that requires not just a, a, you know, a listening ear, which you must have, but it also requires a receptivity of heart yeah. that is yes. very Marian in its character, That's I absolutely must say. right. You know, and, and, and as that chair, if you will, of that, of that family board, you know, your dad can't just pat everybody on the head and say, yes, thank you, you've spoken, now I'm going to tell you what I really think. Right. You know, it really is that receptivity that you're That's talking right. about that allows me to take in those things that are even hard to hear and, and bring, to, bring it to, together into a, a solution or an answer to this particular challenge or problem we're facing that really does bring out the best of what God's doing in all of us. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to a break at this point in time, friends. We want you to give us a call here. We're available for you. We're going to come back with to Jenny calling us from Iowa today, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Please join us for our next episode of EWTN's In Concert series featuring a concert by the Sistine Chapel Choir at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. Maestro Monsignor Massimo Palombella conducts the choir in this performance of beautiful sacred music from the Renaissance period. That's the Sistine Chapel Choir next time on In Concert here on EWTN. It's a message of love, an invitation to healing and forgiveness. 
I was very far away from the church, but God was not very far away from me. Whether they're converts, reverts, atheists, or agnostics, their stories have a similarity. They experience God's love and mercy. What are you waiting for? Now is the time to discover the fullness, wonder, and mystery of the Catholic faith. Join Tom Peterson for Catholics Come Home, Sunday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guests today. We have Dr. Gregory and Lisa Popchak with us. So delighted to have them. We're talking about the Bedatitudes as a pattern, a blueprint, if you will, for how men can father. We certainly do invite you to give us a call here, 800-221-9460. That's 800-221-9460. Or country code 1-205-271. Two nine eight zero. We have Jenny with us. She's calling us from Iowa this morning. Good morning, Jenny. How are you? Good morning, Jeanette Krant. Congratulations on your nuptials. Thank you. Um, glory and praise to you, Jeanette, for your ministry and to the Pop Jacks. I just discovered more to life. You have helped me in more ways than you can ever know. Um, my question is, we have four children. Our younger two, who are teenagers, have really benefited from my husband and I being really rooted in the faith, seeking actively prayer and sacraments. Our older two children are out of the house and in their 20s. Our, my husband and I were less mature. We did all of the Catholic things, all of the, you know, academic things. But my older two children uh, don't have the day-to-day um, regiment of prayer and actively seeking God. Um, any advice for how I could help my older two children, along with my husband, parent them in a godly way as they go through young adulthood? Yeah, sure. You know, I, I think the first thing is, you know, again, bringing prayer right into that relationship. So, you know, for example, if your kids call you up and say, this is going on, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling to find a job or I'm having a hard time with this, this relationship I'm in, you, know, you listen to them, you talk to them. But then at the end of that, you just say, you know, what? I just really feel like I want to pray for you. And you just jump into it. Don't ask permission. Don't say, is it okay that I pray for you? Is it, oh, you should be praying about that. It's just, you know, Lord, please be with them in this situation and really help them find that job that's going to fulfill them and glorify you or please bless them in this situation with relationship relationship and let them know how much you love them and carry them through this time. Amen. You know, you're short, sweet, <laughs> you know, but, but make God part of the conversation. Yeah. Make bar God part of that interaction because they, they start to see God's love shining out through your heart and your relationship. You make it relational because if, if you, if you're too heavy handed about it, you know, well, how come you guys aren't going to church or, you know, you should be praying more. They don't, they don't necessarily understand um, God in that more personal way. So they have to experience him relationally through you. Mm -hmm. and, and by bringing him into the relationship in those very simple, casual, short, sweet ways, it's a very powerful witness uh, because they start experiencing your faith as the source of that warmth and support in the relationship. Yeah, and it, that's especially true, as, as Jenny was saying, if you've done a lot of the academic things that, that supported Catholicism when the kids, you know, I always say, well, if you did algebra homework with them every single day, but it was all, you know, rote and tears and struggle, would they become mathematicians? Probably not. You know, it's a, it's a subject, and we want to always hesitate to turn our faith into just another school subject. We want right. to make sure it's something that's warm and real and um, a, a balm to their souls right. and something that expresses their joy, and we can do that with them when they're that's adults. Right. In fact, we can foster more of a friendship with them when they're adults and bring our very adult faith yeah. to that relationship. That's and that's the other thing I would say, is make sure that you're not just concentrating on the faith when you talk to an adult child. You know, go out to coffee with them, go to a movie with them, hang out with them, go shopping with yeah. them. Build that relationship. relationship. It's, build yeah, that it's relationship. all about that. Because yeah. that's ministry too. I that's, mean, it's, exactly even when you're not right. talking about God. But in those opportunities, you know, if, if you do have a moment where you just say, you know, I was praying about this the other day and I just really wanted you to know how much uh, I really think God loves you and he's really with you in this. And they'll probably roll their eyes, but that's okay. You know, because again, they're experiencing that support. They're experiencing you building that relationship and seeing you there and you slip those little things in. Yeah. It, 
it, it reminds them that God is working and, and makes them wonder, well, how, what, is, you know, what does mom know that I don't? You know, what does dad right. know that I don't hear? And it lets them think. And I've always found, too, Jenny, that you can pack so much into those little prayers. Like, you know, you can pack in, I know that, Father God, I just, you know, praying with Johnny today here and he's struggling so much. In the thing. And we know that you have a perfect plan because you tell us that in sacred scripture. And so we're just asking you now to begin to affect that plan in his life in tangible ways that he can see and touch and feel and smell. You know, and, and you can just, you know, you can remind them of what they learned, Perfect. you know, right. and yeah. what was what was taught to them as children. Well, thank you for your call, Jenny. Thank you for your congratulations. And let's go on to Julianne. She's calling us from New York today. Good morning, Julianne. Good morning. My, my question is that if there's a man who's not very religious and doesn't know what the Beatitudes are, would this book be good for him also? Oh yes, you'd be teaching him a whole lot. That's right. Yeah, well, we, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't assume anything. You know, I, right. I really wanted to write the book um, with the assumption that the person who was reading it maybe never even heard of the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or or maybe this was bought by a wife who really wanted her husband to be more faithful, but wasn't sure what to do, so she could leave this on the toilet tank. You know, uh, <laughs> I used to do things that's like that. Right. Let's face Bathroom it. evangelism that's is yeah. That's part of the practical wisdom of women. Let's face it, the toilet tank is the seat of evangelization. <laughs> no, yeah. So, it's so a good place to put something. I, that was you know going into writing the book. That's exactly what I was thinking of. You know yeah. that that you know that a lot of men might not go and pick up the book themselves, but right. th that their wives might. And you know how could I hook them? Uh, and how could I you know get them to read it, especially if they maybe didn't have a faith or maybe had never been interested in it? You know how could I kind of catch them from the very first chapter on? So so yeah, I, I would like to think, uh, Julianne, that, that, uh, that your, the book is written exactly for the kind of man yeah. that you're speaking of. Yeah, and I just want to say too, Julianne, that, you know, this is something from, from my own personal experience with my husband, Anthony. I came back to the faith before he did, right? And, and so I was, I was overbearing. I'm just going to put it on the table. <laughs> I was absolutely overbearing. And I was pushing him further away than drawing him near. And so there's a certain, you know, there's a certain, um, what do I want to say, uh, 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 feminine aspect called the feminine genius that we have to employ in this. And so if, if we really want our man to make some changes, I mean, now I'm, I'm telling you men all these things. <laughs> I don't know. But, but the idea is, you know, be sure, that, be sure that he knows how much you love him. Be sure that you're affirming him. Be sure that you're raising him up in ways. Catch him. You know, we say this about kids. Catch them doing something right and, and tell them about it. So small little things. Gee, thanks for picking your socks up off the floor, honey. That was very sweet of you. Any small thing. To, because then what you do is you help for him to be receptive to what it is that you want to say, and you're putting more dollars in the bank yeah. than you're going to withdraw when you have to give him a word that might, uh, you know, might not sit quite as well. But if you if you are constantly building him in that way, then it's going to make um, it's, it's going to reap beautiful benefits for you. So I would suggest that to you. Yeah, I think I think often when we when we fall in love with the Lord. Um, it, and if our spouse isn't there with us, it often makes us bossy, you know, <laughs> you know um, and, and in, in, instead of more loving, you know, <laughs> That's right. and, and, and so it, the way to evangelize our spouse is to really let them say, wow, you know, my husband, my wife has really become so much more generous, so much more loving, so much more thoughtful, so much more considerate since they've been going to church. What's that about? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and they start to experience that relational grace and wondering, well, where is that coming from? And now, as soon as they ask you that, why are you being so nice to me all of a sudden? Well, it's because I know how much God loves you and he wants me to communicate that to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's very true. And, and you had mentioned something, Lisa, when we were on break, and we were talking about the fact that, uh, you know, for so many women who are hearing this about be daditudes, uh, if the dad isn't in the home, the idea is, gee, you know, I wish it could have been like this. Yeah. But sometimes the dad is in the home, and it's not like that. Exactly. So what would you say to women who are struggling with that? We're kind of approaching it here. Mm -hmm. But there are things that they can do, uh, besides leaving the book on the toilet tank, which <laughs> I think is a good idea because we want you to buy the book. <laughs> well, I, I agree 100% with Greg. This is about, and, and as you have said so brilliantly, you know, marriage is about purification. And often we think it's about our spouse's purification, <laughs> not ours. Truly. No, we have nothing, yeah. especially once we've fallen in love with God. We mm -hmm. don't need to be purified. He's got us. We're good. <laughs> but it's about do we love them or are we making them, for back, lack of a better term, church widows? Are we running to the, the women's group mm -hmm. or the men's group? Are we volunteering for a thousand ministries at church? We're making up for the lack of spiritual intimacy in our marriage by, by running off to church, church to get that need fulfilled instead of That's really scary. trying to find instead ways to build that intimacy at home. 
So What's my, my vocation is to love God first and then this person before the church ministry, before my women's group, before. And so we love more mm -hmm. when we look for the good. Mm -hmm. And we, we, if you have to, write it down. Write down everything you ever loved about your spouse and make sure you're saying it and make sure you're doing those little things and make sure they know that this new love is all about having a transformed heart because God transformed It's true. It, the interesting thing that God told me once in prayer when I was complaining about my husband and I said, why is it always me, Lord? He said, because you're the believer. Oh. You're the believer. Yeah. And so we have to love more, yeah. right? And it's not to say we're not loving, but maybe we just learn how to love as Jesus loved. And this book helps dads do that with their children. It is The Bedatitudes, Eight Ways to Be an Awesome Dad, available for you out there at EWTNRC.com. Go buy a copy for yourself and all your friends. We're going to see you soon. God bless you. Bye-bye now. I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers of the Archdiocese of Portland in Oregon. And today on Faith Matters, I'd like to speak with you about praying with your spouse. <laughs> now, uh, often couples fall away from certain practices in their faith that they did when they were first married. You know, often I have couples that come to see me at the parish, many of them not even parishioners, uh, who will come in and they'll want to talk to me about what's going on in their marriage. And so they'll be sitting there on the couch and I'll be listening to them go back and forth. And, you know, I'll interject and I'll say, excuse me, let me ask you guys a question. When's the last time you prayed together? And they'll look at each other like, well, what, what, what do you mean? I said, well, when's the last time you prayed together? I don't mean meal prayers. I mean, sat down in a room together looked at each other, held each other's hands, or, or just prayed together to God. You are one flesh, aren't you? They said, well, okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, I said, well, you know what? If your answer is my wedding day, that's why you're here. Often people find it difficult to pray with their spouse because it's uncomfortable or because uh, they feel their prayer styles are very different. That was the case for my wife and I. I mean, uh, I have a Benedictine background. So I love structured prayer with ribbons and books and Latin and that kind of thing. My wife likes more free flow, from the heart, you know, extemporaneous prayer and, uh, you know, never the twain shall meet. <laughs> so, so what do we do? We keep it really simple. When I get up in the morning, uh, I say my quick morning prayer as I get out of bed. Lord, thank you for allowing me to see the light of another day so that I may give honor praise and glory to your most holy name. And then I say, Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I say that three times. And then I go back into bed and I hold my wife and I say something very simple. Lord, thank you for the gift of my wife. Thank you for our 20 plus years together. Thank you for the great gift of our beautiful children. Lord, help me to be the husband and the father that I need to be for them today. Amen. And then my wife says something back to me, and then 
I start my day. Now, how long did that take? A minute, minute and a half? There are 100 and 